Welcome to Discovering. Birds come in many shapes and sizes. Some peck on wood, and some are made out of it. We'll find out what it takes to create these incredible works of art. I can spend anywhere from 200 to some of the bigger carvings. I've put in six, seven, eight hundred hours into them. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan On this show, we've seen trees turn into axe handles, fish, game calls, bowls, animals, and more. I visited the shop of Mike Willard to see how he turned trees into birds. The way I got into this was um, really not planned. Um, I've been woodworking since I was a kid. You know, I have a good understanding of wood, what you can do with it. I have the, the proper tools for forming wood into attractive things. So I decided, well, I'm going to carve a bird. Gave it a shot. It was um, kind of crude compared to the standards today. You know, normally I'm looking to get a little bit better at this every time I do a project. To me, it, it felt like it was a fun process. It was easy to do and uh, it just blossomed from there. This project right here is a is a work in progress. It's a male pine grosbeak speak that's going to be mounted on habitat to represent um, an autumn crabapple tree. The idea is to make this look graceful, to make the bird look like he's doing something. I start gathering photos, either photos that I've taken right here in our yard or out in the woods, gather photos that are available on the internet so that I can see all of the different angles of the bird here and how to carve the different components. I need to know what they call the wing cord here, which is the distance from here to the tip of the wing so I get the right dimensions on the wing. Uh, I need to know what the eye size is. It's important with the eyes that you're able to show an expression that's appropriate for the sculpture that you're doing and it relates to how the bird is uh, interacting with its environment. The tail feathers, it's important to know how these are going to be structured on the bird for the bird to look realistic. I gathered up pictures that represented the side and the top view that I needed to get this bird roughed out. Transferred that over to another sheet, which is a much larger pattern. It gives me room to remove wood here. And then you transfer that to a block of wood. And what I'm trying to do here is to get the dimensions of the bird so it looks realistic. I've got the wings that are the right size, the tail length is the right the right size eyes in here and all the proportions are, are what a bird would naturally look like. And what I'm trying to do is to get a, a flow here so that when somebody looks at this, their eye is naturally drawn to the bird and what the bird is doing. i show you an example here. It's a red-breasted nuthatch. What I did is I sketched out patterns so that the dimensions were all the same when I folded this thing over from the top view and the side view. The lines for the head and the tail feathers and such would all be proportional with each other. And what I did is I cut patterns just out of um, cardstock here. I transfer that to the side. I do that after I study the grain on here. I want that grain to run as much as it possibly can, the length of the wings and the tail and the beak here so that there's strength in the wood after I carve it. Your top pattern goes up here, your reference lines here, to make sure that your, your beak and your head and your tail feathers are all going to line up. And then what I do is I take this to a bandsaw and I carve this out, remove these pieces, and then I put double-sided carpet tape on there and I re-stick these pieces of wood back together so it looks almost just like it did when I got started, only you're going to see the saw mark lines here. And then I cut the top view. 
And this is what you end up with when you get done. Draw my center lines that go right down the middle of the body here. I also do that for the tail. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you keep those center lines redrawn at all times. That's basically how you get started. I use these larger Dremel tools for actually um, hogging out the wood to get rid of all the, the large, sharp edges and that type of stuff. And then I move into something that's called a micromotor. These are extremely precise. These are made by a company that makes dental tools. All we're doing at this point is just trying to take off the sharp edges and to make this thing look like it's actually going to be a bird. A little slower speed. Basswood is used by an awful lot of carvers. It's a little softer than what Tupelo is. Tupelo is my wood of preference. It, it has a very open grain. You don't have a lot of distinct grain lines on it. When this is sanded, which I would do before I start drawing out a bird on here, it's very smooth. There's no knots in here or any, there are not many checks. And it does very well with power carving equipment like these rotary tools I'm doing here. The difference between this and the basswood is that the basswood being softer, if you use a rotary tool on it, it has a tendency to fuzz up more along the edges when your cut lines. And when that happens, you just have to end up doing more sanding. So it's a little bit more of a tedious process. Um, if you're a, a strictly a knife carver and you're using carving knives or gouges, then the basswood is probably your best bet because that'll cut very cleanly with knives. It's not as hard as what the tupelo is. and It'll be a little bit easier to work. One of the things that can kind of mess these up is the oils and the moisture in your hand. The moisture in your hand from handling these will actually raise the grain and it'll obliterate some of your fine detail in there. The oils in your hand, once that penetrates the wood, it's kind of difficult to get out and it'll make it difficult for the um, water-based paints to actually adhere to this bird. I do it on a pillow to begin with, so I'm not hitting anything sharp that would um, damage any of the edges that I've already carved. I'm going to use a soft nylon glove that's not going to absorb any of the stuff from my skin and I use that to keep the surface of this thing clean. Normally what I would do is I would, I would carve the shape of the bird and I would carve the, the wings and the flight feathers on the wings. I, I save the tail for last because once you thin out these tail feathers, it's, um, it's an area that's a little susceptible to breaking and I don't want to do that because it's very, very difficult if not impossible to repair. So I do that, then I go through and I carve all the body feathers on this, then I texture anything that needs to be textured, and then I do the burning on it. So we're getting out of sequence with this simply because I want to show you the different layers in, in the process. And normally I would also wait a little bit later to set the eyes on here. What I had to do here is to put a little bit of clear lacquer sealer around that area. And using a water-based two-part epoxy clay, I'm able to do that without raising the surrounding grain because I get you know, moisture in there from the, the water-based clay. And when I carve these feathers, I use what they call a blue stone. They're usually, it's kind of like a ceramic stone. And I've, I've drawn these feathers in. I kind of vary the direction a little bit and the size of the feather. All you're really seeing is the tip of the feather here. You're not seeing the whole feather. And some feathers are largely hidden. Some are sticking out, you know, a lot more, more than their neighbors are. I'm not carving too deep around the perimeter of each of these feathers, because these feathers they kind of flow together, a little softer feather, and uh, you don't want a hard edge there. The idea is when you get done, you have a kind of a lump on here that looks like a feather. You get a little bit of a rounded dome to it, uh, which is the natural shape of the feather, and the feathers flow into each other, and it's, it's okay when you get ready to texture this and burn it, if you even kind of like bring that texture down a little bit past the tip of this feather into the one below. Um, that'll actually make it look a little bit more realistic. Okay. Now we have to do just a little bit of gentle sanding on this. So we take some of our little sandpaper pieces here. And I'm being careful not to sand in the middle of the feather because I want that little bit of a dome shape in there. Get into the body feathers on the breast and the belly of this. Those feathers are going to be a little bit larger and they're even more free-flowing. So they kind of, you know, you get barbs crossing here and there and um, it's a very fluffy type of look. These on the top of the head here. Are, um, they're not real prominent feathers, and you want them to be pretty soft, but they're not quite as soft as what you'd have in the belly or the breast. If 
you don't like sanding things, this is not the job for you. A lot of sanding. I like to kind of start with a clean slate every time I move on to the next step, so I want to keep things fairly smooth on here. Now what I've done is I've moved up to some folded um, 400 grit. I'm going to get in here and just kind of soften those edges up a little bit more. By the way, when this bird is, is completed, I'll have roughly 300 hours worth of work into this, uh, this project. That doesn't include the, the research and all the design that goes into it, but it does include the work that you have to do on the habitat, which is pretty substantial. When you move into the feather detail, I can show you an example of a couple things here. We'll do a little bit of work on that pine grosbeak. I have a wing here, a sample of how you go about doing this. We're going to use a little bit more of a precise tool for this one because we want everything pretty smooth. I've already started carving this and uh, I burned some feathers in with a wood burning knife and I'll show you I left a few feathers here that haven't been completed. This is a relatively easy process with a rotary tool. I use a kind of a special sandpaper configuration here. I've got several different grits. This is a sandpaper that's made over in Switzerland and it has a self-adhesive back and I cut strips of this. I fold them back on each other with a piece of cardstock in here to stiffen them up a little bit. The next step from here would be to um, kind of ease some of these sharp edges. The outside of that feather, those barbs are very, very thin, so you want these to be able to lay on top of each other. So what I've done here is I've taken a wood burning knife and I've undercut this feather a little bit and raised it so the secondaries sit a little bit above the primaries in that area there. The other thing that I've done here to add some realism, bird feathers aren't perfect. They get kind of messed up now and then, so I've cut some splits in here with a scalpel. And these are things you would naturally see on a live bird. You can do that two different ways. You can either use the scalpel like I did there, or we can move on to a wood burning knife. And I mark in where I'd want to do some splits here. And the idea is to run that knife at kind of slow and a little hotter temperature. You're carving feather barbs in here, but you're actually removing that wood in between the barbs. If you were going to try to do that with any other tool, it would be impossible because those slits would just close right back up and you wouldn't have the proper texture on that. I've also done one other thing here too. I've carved in the, the feather quill. And we're going to start burning in these individual barbs. A typical songbird's going to have anywhere from 20 to 30,000 of these barbs by the time you get done burning in. If you don't have a lot of experience working with a a wood burning knife like this, you're best to do it kind of very slow and at a low heat. You can always come back and burn them a little bit deeper than this. When I burn these feathers, I generally like to work from the bottom up, so it allows you to drag a little bit of that top feather into that bottom feather, so you get a natural edge there. That's basically all that's involved in this. You know, when, if you're having a good day and you get your rhythm down, you can actually burn probably 100 barbs per inch which is pretty fine detail on this. That's really what turns a kind of a blob of a feather into something that's going to look real. And it depends on the type of feather you're burning to. These flight feathers here on this wing, they have a little coarser barb, so you don't need to get quite that close. When you start moving into some of these top feathers up in here, the body feathers, then you want to get a little finer detail on there. And Generally what I'll do on those is to go through and, and burn them pretty light, and then I can always go back and re-burn these things on top of the feathers that were born before and put more barbs in there. What I've done on this one too, as you can see, there's some texturing here. On this wing, you're looking at these um, nape feathers or these lesser coverts that are on top of here. And on a bird like this um, pine grosbeak, these are pretty structured feathers in here, so you're gonna see distinct edges on them. But I've also brought feathers that would be normally in the breast here and brought those over there. And I've done that with some texturing on here, and then I burn on top the texturing. And I've already got these textured, but I'll just texture one of these other feathers here for the heck of it. I'm burning in feather barbs, but I'm burning in clumps of, you know, two or more barbs in here. These are pretty thick spacings on them. 
So I'll go through with the Bernie knife and I'll actually carve a couple of barbs on top of each one of those lines in there. And that's what actually gives this feather a little bit more depth. It gives it a sense of being fluffy. You can see that these feathers that I've carved up here are actually a kind of a dome shape in here, the way a natural feather would be. Any fluff that you can add to that is going to make it look, you know, a lot more realistic. It's going to look like a real bird feather. The other thing I can do here too, if I want to add some deeper texture, is I can take some of these texture lines that I just carved in here, and I can burn them deeper. Natural feathers have that. You don't want to burn these barbs as a straight line. Birds don't have straight line feathers, except for when you get into these flight feathers on the wings and the tail. These barbs go in a little different directions. Either burn them in kind of a C shape or even an S shaped. We're actually removing wood with heat. It sort of melts those fibers away. What you need to do to clean this up a little bit, we want to remove some of that carbon that's still left in there. Okay, that's all there is to that. If you don't have something like this, you can just use a fine bristle brush. A toothbrush works great, but you want to get some of that junk in there that's still loose from the burning. few other carvings that um, I still have in my possession here. This one's a red-winged blackbird. Uh, the inspiration for this actually came from a, a road trip downstate. We were driving by a cattail marsh on the side of the road and I saw a red-winged blackbird doing their normal thing, screeching their lungs out, hanging on a cattail. So I came home and carved one. The um, cattail leaves on this are made out of copper. The stems for the cattail are actually copper as well. The cattail, this part up here in the top, these are done out of aspen. And this is a black walnut base. And I've added something a little different to this base. I've added some ripples here to try to give it a little bit of an effect as if it's these cattails are coming out of the water. And the cattails are actually the center of where the ripples begin and then they move out from there. This one's called Marsh Melody. This carving is a um, ruby-throated hummingbird that's feeding on a coral honeysuckle vine. This one's called Tiny Dancer. The painting process on this is, I've used some different mediums in here. These are actually blended with the acrylic paints, but I use gold and green and, and ruby red, a couple different colors of green. These are iridescent powders that are blended in with the paints in, in certain areas on this bird because the hummingbird does have an iridescent quality to its feathers. And when the sun's shining on it, it just sparkles. It looks like it's almost alive. And this particular one is a black-capped chickadee, one of our favorite birds in the backyard. Um, he's mounted on a, um, a cherry tree branch. Uh, so this is a spring scene. And you'll see things right down to the little fungus spots and stuff on the leaves to add realism to this. This is a good example where I've used various forms of moss or lichen patched here and there on, on the branches to make them look realistic. But the sculpture is designed so that it's freestanding, there's no base here. And also, you know, when the viewer is looking at something like this, everything kind of comes to a point and actually brings your attention to the bird, which is really what this whole thing is all about. The habitat is there is just to, to show the bird and its natural surroundings and uh, to add a little extra beauty to the, to the piece. This is another bird at rest sculpture. This is a uh, cedar wax wing. This one is a little bit more of an elegant styled bird, so you don't see quite as much rigid structure in the feathers. Uh, there's one aspect to this that made this a little bit more tricky. I had to carve all these little waxy feathers on the back, which is what gives these birds their name. This piece um, is called the Moment of Truth. It's an actual scene that um, I was shooting with the still camera um, right out the back window here in the yard. It's a sharp shin hawk, which is one of the smaller hawks that we, we have in this area. And they, they have a tendency to like to hang out around bird feeders because they feed on songbirds. And they take out some of the slower birds out here, the morning doves, occasionally a blue jay or two. They're not that big of a bird. They're not really much bigger than, than what a blue jay or a morning dove would be, other than they have a little larger wingspan on them. This one was a scene where this hawk was coming down on two house sparrows, a male and a female. Again, we call it moment of truth, and um, only I know how it ends, so. <laughs> That started with this. The first few birds that I did were um, actually carved out of popple. Uh, I found out real quick that there's just too much pitch in that stuff and the grain is, you know, you get a lot of bumps in the grain on it. So it didn't work real well, but the birds turned out okay. What I used at that point was just a sharp carving knife. 
you know, and that's basically all you need. Um, I had a kind of an inexpensive wood burner that was a little bit rough. It didn't do the kind of fine detail work that you can do with these that, where you're cutting almost with a razor blade on the end of that knife. But a good sharp carving knife, um, a chunk of wood of your choice, get yourself some, some kind of pattern that you can either buy or you can develop it on your own by looking up some information online and you're all set to go. For a setup like this, I probably got a couple thousand dollars, not including the table saw and the router here, uh, just in carving equipment. You don't need to do that. Uh, you're going to spend for one or two good carving knives that have good sharp blades that will hold their edge, 40 to $50 for a couple of knives. Uh, you're going to need some sandpaper. You can buy an inexpensive wood burner. You may have to modify the tips so they're a little bit sharper. You can probably get one for about 30, 40 bucks. So you know you could probably get into this whole thing for less than $100. You can buy inexpensive acrylic paints. They have a tendency to have more of a gloss to them, which may not look as natural on your birds because most of these birds don't have a sheen to their feathers. You can buy those things so probably for 75 cents a bottle at any hobby store or craft store. So there's really not a lot. It just but it takes patience and make sure that you know you take a look at what the bird really looks like through photos or just personal observation before you start carving on this thing. Make some notes and do some sketching and, and uh, then you have to start working on the feather detail. First bird that I ever carved it probably didn't take me nearly as long as, as they do today. You know, again, I can spend anywhere from 200 to some of the bigger carvings. I put in six, seven, eight hundred hours into them. You can do something like this and you can probably complete this in about 30, 40 hours worth of work paint it with some cheap paints and it's going to look an awful lot like a red-breasted nuthatch. Mike sent me some pictures of the end result of his work in progress. Here's a look at the finished version of his pine grosbeak. beak. 